Are you looking for brew day inspiration? Do you want to take a deep dive into the technical side of brewing? Visit BrewersPublications.com and discover the latest titles from experts and award-winning brewers. Brewers Publications books cover a variety of beer topics from alt beer to zwickle and everything in between. Shop BrewersPublications.com and take your brewing to the next level. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, October 25th, 2018. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, home brewer and engineer Alex Roberts helps me conduct an experiment. How fast should your chilling water flow through your immersion chiller? Should you gush or trickle? Is there, is there a hybrid strategy that's the most efficient? Stay tuned. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear, including our tie-dye silicone pint. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Basic Brewing, and find our show page on Facebook. We have a cool basic brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you do us the favor of rating us on iTunes, maybe leaving a nice comment, they say that uh, new listeners will find us better that way. If you want to support us financially, uh, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Uh, and uh, thanks to everybody who's been uh, helping us out in that manner. Uh, if you s- subscribe to us on Patreon at patreon.com slash basicbrewing, uh, I try to give uh, a, a bunch of good goodies for you, like uh, recipes uh, from our video podcasts and uh, early releases and behind-the-scenes videos that nobody else sees uh, but uh, but our financial supporters. So uh, uh, if you go there, you will get something in return. We're not a charity. <laughs> we, we, uh, we, you know, you're not just contributing, contributing something or contributing, if you want to say it that way. Uh, we give you something in return. So it's a subscription, not a donation. Uh, the uh, Halloween video episode is uh, in the can, as they say. Uh, Steve came over last night, Steve Wilkes of stevesbrewshop.com, and we sampled my booberry tart made from monster cereal booberry. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it. Will it be gray? Will it be green? Will it make Steve just a little bit ill? Or will he like it? <laughs> You'll have to watch the video episode to find out. Uh, Steve, while he was here, also helped me bottle my second batch of uh, makgeolli, or Korean rice wine. Now, this is the batch that I made uh, with my or, or with dry German uh, wheat beer yeast instead of bread yeast. I was hoping to get like a, a banana character out of it. Uh, not sure if uh, if I got that, but it's it, it taste it turned out tasty. Uh, the bottling process went a lot smoother uh, with the method uh, that I used or we used this time. Uh, Steve uh, helped greatly in that. Um, we we captured it all on video for a future Basic Brewing video episode. Um, so look for that in the next few weeks. Uh, we also sampled a, a couple of commercial examples of Nigori Sake, which has rice solids in it, and you shake it up to make it cloudy. Uh, you know, it looks, looks kind of like makgeolli. But um, I have to say we like the homebrew makgeolli better than the commercial examples uh, that uh, that I had. Now, I have had a, a, a good example of Nagori uh, back when Andy Sparks and I went up to Sake One uh, and toured their facility. Uh, they served a, a cloudy or a Nagori uh, sake, and that was delicious. But these... These commercial examples that I was available or that I was uh, found available here in Northwest Arkansas were not uh, what we were expecting, Steve and I. So anyway, uh, chalk went up uh, in that competition to a home brewed uh, makgeolli. I have to brag on my uh, Poncho's keg cooler from our sponsor, Poncho's Brewing Lab. Every fall here at the house, we have a, a small group of friends over to uh, carve pumpkins. And uh, eat stuff and and uh, and enjoy a little bit of beers. Uh, in the past, I've used a, a plastic kitchen wastebasket to to hold my keg of homebrew, uh, but the ice in there melts pretty quickly and it leaves a puddle of condensation around in the area. It's pretty messy. Well, this year I had my Poncho's keg cooler, 
It's, it's a 20-gallon cylindrical cooler that's big enough to hold a 5-gallon corny keg. And mine's got a built-in tap, which makes it easy for guests to serve themselves. Uh, this year it rained, so I had to put the beer up on the porch instead of the driveway. And it was great not having a wet mess around the keg-serving area up on the porch. Uh, and Poncho has designed a sticker for the front of the keg cooler, which you can use to... Uh, you can use chalk to, to write the name of your beer on it. So very impressive looking, very neat looking, uh, and very functional as well. And something new, Poncho has upgraded the uh, faucet on the keg cooler to a stainless steel retractable intertap faucet that automatically closes after release. Also, uh, there is a new version available, the Poncho's Keg Cooler Pro. It comes with a Sankey tap. So the cooler can be used with a sextal or a quarter barrel Sankey keg uh, in addition to the ball lock corny. And you can customize your Poncho's keg cooler on the website, ponchosbrewinglab.com. That's P-A-N-C-H-O-S brewinglab.com. Go there, check them out, and use the code BBR to save 15% on any Poncho's keg cooler. That's at uh, ponchosbrewinglab.com. you got to love it. I'm, I'm, I'll post a picture uh, of my uh, Poncho's keg cooler on Instagram and such. And it's color-coordinated for Halloween. Maybe you could dress it up uh, to look like a, a uh, jack-o'-lantern. <laughs> a cylindrical, tall cylindrical jack-o'-lantern full of beer. <laughs> uh, better than pumpkin guts. Uh, let's take a look into the mailbag. I got great response after the uh, previous show with Ricky the Mead Maker, and that was a, f a fun conversation. A listener John writes in, I loved the last podcast with Ricky the Mead Maker. He's a great guest, but I think you said something incorrect. You stated that you can drink PBW. I'm pretty sure you meant Star Sand. Same company, different product. I've read about the owner of, of Five Star drinking Star Sand. Maybe you can drink PBW, but I would avoid it. <laughs> well, thanks, John. I think you're probably right. Ricky, we were talking about the safety of commercial sanitizing products, and he said that uh, PBW mixed properly would be safe to drink. Uh, by the way, we said immediately after that that we didn't recommend it <laughs> for legal reasons. Uh, so he was probably referring to Starsan. But uh, I'll emphasize, and I think Ricky would back me up on this, that we don't recommend drinking any sanitizing or cleaning products, no matter how you dilute them. <laughs> but but I do appreciate the clarification, John. Follow the label directions. Drink beer, not cleaning products. Uh, Jake from Redding, California writes, I loved your interview with Ricky the Mead Maker and his connected article. Your guys' attitude toward facts slash pseudo facts really resonates with me as a home brewer. I've been brewing for about a year and after 17 batches, I'd like to try my first mead. My question is, Jake says, what does a water profile look like for mead making? I'm planning on brewing a two and a half gallon batch of Groenfels Valkyrie's Choice. Hmm. Well, I sent that note to Ricky and he responded, uh, as you can imagine, water chemistry for mead is a rabbit hole stretching to untold depths. That said, we have a very simple solution in-house. Ricky says we strip our water down with a charcoal filter, then use 12 pounds of Y-yeast nutrient blend per 1,000 gallons to build up the mineral profile as well as give essential nutrients to the yeast. I assume Ricky uh, means 12 pounds, 12 number sign, 12 hashtag. <laughs> Uh, Ricky says there are other ways to go about it, but that has worked well for everything from one-gallon batches up to full production. So you have to scale that down. <laughs> 12, 12 pounds divided by 1,000 gallons uh, times 2.5 for Jake. <laughs> well, thanks to Ricky uh, for the advice and Jake for the question. It's really cool that Ricky and uh, Gruenfell Meadery are so open about their recipes and processes. Now, I told you last week that I was planning on brewing an experimental 10-gallon split batch of my electric brew-in-a-bag system from our friends and sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa. Well, I did it, and the process it turned out great. 
um, just as I hoped and planned. Um, I first started the brew as I would have normal five gallon all grain batch. I, I poured in eight gallons of water into the system. I set the Warthog controller to 150 degrees Fahrenheit or 65 C and went about went about my business setting, setting up the rest of the brew day there, setting up the table and getting out the ingredients and all that. And when I was ready to continue, the strike water was holding rock steady at 150. I dowed in my grain and did other things uh, while, again, the Warthog controller held steady at 150 for the mash, for that one-hour mash. Uh, and here's where the process started to deviate from normal. I took out the grain bag and collected my wort and then added dry malt extract and five more gallons of water. Now, I did this because... I don't have a pulley set up, uh, and I was brewing alone. So, uh, you know, it's it, 10, 10 pounds of wet grain, 10 or 12 pounds is, is fine. I can do that. But, you know, I, I didn't want to didn't want to strain myself uh, by pulling out 20 pounds of, of wet grain. So anyway, I did a, a partial mash. I did the, the first part the, as a regular mash and just added the extract uh, to get the extra fermentables. So anyway... Uh, the boil went well as well. The kettle was was pretty full. <laughs> I was a little nervous, but I was it was awesome because I was able to use the Warthog controller to accurately dial in the power level uh, to avoid a boil over. Uh, so it had a nice vigorous boil, but I didn't have to worry about it coming coming out uh, while it boiled down a little bit. So after the after the one hour boil, I chilled down to ninety degrees Fahrenheit or thirty two C, and at that point, I collected half of the wort into a carboy. Then I continued to chill the rest down to 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 C. And I, I put that into a second carboy. So both were pitched with imperial loki or loci, loki yeast. <laughs> um, the, uh, the cooler one went down into the basement and the warm and wa warmer one went into a water bath in the high gravity electric system. Uh, so, you know, I put some water in there, put the carboy uh, in there. Six and a half gallon carboy fits just right into that uh, big old, you know, 50, 15 and a half gallon kettle with, with the basket in it. So I set the Warthog controller to mash mode and set it to 90 degrees Fahrenheit and let nature take its course. I, I posted some pictures on Instagram. Uh, the warmer batch that was in the water bath in the high gravity system took off and was vigorously fermenting in just a few hours. Um, in fact, I had to put some firm, firm cap ass in there to uh, calm down the foam a little bit. And the next day, the basement batch had pretty much caught up with the warmer batch, at least as far as foam production. So I had to put some more firm cap ass in there <laughs> to avoid a, a, a blow off. So it's a fun experiment and... Um, I'm looking forward to the, the results, but it would be hard to do without the very flexible and capable system, electric brewing system from High Gravity in Tulsa. High Gravity has a variety of systems, all the way from single vessel to three vessel and from five gallons up to two barrels. You can check them all out at highgravitybrew.com and use the promo code EBC75BB to save 75 bucks off your electric gear purchase. That's at highgravitybrew.com. Okay, we've talked about the challenges of chilling wort, especially in environments where water is scarce. So uh, I, asked, I asked my friend Alex Roberts to help me design an experiment determining the best strategy for chiller flow rate through an immersion chiller, you know, how fast you run that uh, water through there. So uh, metric users will be miffed at us, but uh, <coughs> here's a key. Uh, my tap water uh, that I used for the chilling liquid to go through the chiller was at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, or 23 C. The starting temperature of our kettle water, which we were chilling down, was 200 degrees Fahrenheit, or 93 C. And our target temp was 80 degrees Fahrenheit, or 27 C. Alex Roberts, welcome back to Basic, Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you, James. <laughs> if I can remember the name of my own show. <laughs> and we haven't been drinking anything but water. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> that I know of. <laughs> it's, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Who knows what you've been doing. 
Uh, you were kind enough to help me out with, uh, with an experiment I called upon your engineering uh, background uh, and your experience with uh, collecting data for experiments. And, and uh, you know, you've got some, some couple of toys that I don't have. And, and you also called upon uh, a friend of yours as well to help us out. I want to give him a shout out as well. Yeah, Keith Rogers, my business partner um, with our company, Applied Dynamics Engineering. Um, he came out and helped a little with the experiment as well. So, right, it's good to have him. Yeah, thanks very much to Keith. Um, I was I got the, the idea for this experiment because it's still warm outside uh, here in northwest Arkansas. It's going to change this weekend. But uh, chilling uh, using an immersion chiller is always a challenge because the groundwater temperature is so high, at least here at my house. I don't have a well. I go off of city water. And so my, uh, my question was, should, it, should we be opening the spigot all the way and you know, blowing uh, chilling water through the, the immersion coils and, uh, to cool down the wort? Or you know, is, it, is it more efficient to, to make it go slower through the thing? Uh, and, uh, or is there a hybrid? You know, is, there, is there a solution that is uh, a combination of the two that, is, that it gets the, the most efficiency time-wise and most efficiency as far as water usage? So that's why I called you in, so we could collect some data points. Uh, but I guess, what are, the, what are some of the factors that, when you're thinking about chilling most efficiency with an immersion chiller, what are some of the factors uh, that, uh, that go into, the, you know, the variables that go into this equation? Yeah, you know, you and I talked a little bit earlier, and we, we had some questions related to that. But, you know, two of the things we mainly mentioned was the, the coil diameter of the chiller as well as the length of the coil that's in the liquid. And, and also the, the temperature of the chilling water going through, because I'm assuming that uh, <laughs> you'll get a much more rapid chilling rate with uh, colder water going through. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, obviously your ambient air and temperature and the, some of the, your, you know, your surroundings will, will have an effect on that as well. And I, I've read an article. I did find an article. There was a reference in one of the, um, uh, one of the I think it was Homebrew Talk, maybe. Somebody referenced an article in the January, February 2012 issue of Zymergy. Uh, which I just happen to have. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so next time my wife tells me to clear things out, I'll say, hey, it's useful uh, that I'm hoarding all these magazines. Uh, but it was an article called The Thermodynamics of Immersion Chillers by Will Trice. And uh, he goes, it, uh, it, it, it says, it, it carries a, a warning that it was, it's extra geeky. And boy, it is. It's got formulas that you probably hadn't seen since uh, college. Yeah, if I ever did. You know, I mean, my <laughs> thermodynamics was pretty limited. I'm a mechanical engineering background, and there's, there's a minimal amount of that. But I didn't, I didn't pursue any of the, you know, the HVAC or the thermodynamics type related careers. I went more of the mechanical route. So. And Will, uh, what he did was he, he compared different uh, diameters of uh, copper chillers, uh, you know, different lengths, uh, um, you know, the coolant rate flow as well, um, and came up with, with a lot of what I was looking for. But, but what I was mostly looking for was, you know, what is the, uh, what is, he, he collected data over total time of chilling. So, you know, this, this diameter of copper tubing uh, at this flow uh, took this long to cool wort from one temperature to another, and, and there was no data curve to show how quickly each of those happened. So uh, do you remember the parameters of the experiment, what we were, <laughs> what we were doing? Yes. Uh, well, basically, you know, we, we kept our, our groundwater stayed constant. We did check that temperature, and I think, what, it was around 75? Is that correct? 75 Fahrenheit. Right. And, um, you know, it was, it was the, the temperature outside didn't change much over the course of the experiment. We were, you know, looking at that. Um, so that I don't think our, our environmental factors really mm -hmm. affected our experiment much. Um, then what we were doing was we were measuring the output flow rate um, at the end of the holes that was connected on the output side of the, the chiller. Um, so that, that was our, our main variable was, you know, that was what was changing experiment to experiment uh, with the exception of experiments one and two where you may, you'll get into this later, I'm sure, but you actually shook the chiller while it was inside the liquid um, every five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, you know, our, our variables that we were changing was um, was the actual flow rate of the liquid going through the chiller. 
And we chose to, uh, we're using the high gravity uh, system. Uh, so with the Warthog uh, controller, so we were able to uh, dial up a, a starting temperature pretty easily. Uh, and that was 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And we really should have, we should have uh, uh, translated these to Celsius for our, <laughs> they're yelling at me now. Um, but, uh, but we started at, at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And because of the temperature of the, of the water, we decided a good cutoff temperature was 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So we were going down, uh, trying to go from 200 down to 80 uh, as as quickly as possible, uh, and my goal in the beginning was to uh, because the common knowledge and including the, the knowledge in this in this article and other articles that I've found online, it says that if you move the the chiller in the water in the wort or in the water in this case, uh, or move the the water around the chiller, uh, that you will get a uh, a faster chilling rate and I've always thought that that was true because uh, when I have my immersion chiller in there um, I let it go for a little while and then I come back and I and I stir using the chiller and the output uh, copper of that chiller gets hot right away I mean it seems like it's taken a lot more heat out uh, it, it just it it, it appears to me that it cools faster. Yeah, and even on this experiment, we we noticed the same thing. You know, when you were when you were moving it, it did seem to increase the output temperature at the at the output side of the chiller. So we we our first round, I think we did. Uh, I decided that my my common uh, method is to like every five minutes come and stir the the work with the chiller. So that's what we did on the on the first round, I believe. Uh, it was the first round. Yeah, it was. And uh, so. Uh, what did we see on the on the graph when when that happened? Well, we'll, well real quick, just talk about the test setup as far as what I was collecting. Um, it was just a single thermocouple, you know, emerged in the liquid, and the, the target was basically the center of the liquid, mm -hmm. um, without the location of the thermocouple changing. And it was collecting data. I mean, it was taking a temperature every second, so every second it would output a, a temperature versus time and then we would plot those over the course of the time um so really all we saw with that first experiment it was you know it was the the lines like you're used to seeing as far as a a steep slope at the beginning with a high uh cooling rate versus kind of falling off as we would get down to the lower temperature but what was unique to the stirring was each time you would stir you would see peaks of actual temperature increase on the thermocouple and uh, what was happening there is basically you're moving hotter liquid from one pot or the pot to the other you're you're basically increasing the temperature at the point where the thermocouple is reading but the overall temperature as far as the the slope of the lines not being drastically affected by it um and so when we saw that you know it was kind of making it jaggedy and it was making a curve that wasn't quite so pretty so you know we we talked about well let's run the same flow rate without stirring and well, let's let's see what happens when when that happens and there's also a uh there's also a, a temperature probe with the uh warthog controller but it is actually closer to the the heating element, the the Blickman boil coil, it's on, and it's on the side of the of the kettle. So in the beginning, we would get you know sort of different uh, temperature readings, but over time that evened out. Where right. at the end, you know, when we got near uh, the target temperature, those those evened out quite a bit. So what did we see? I mean, what did you we we ran the test again with the same flow rate, and this was the with the the spigot on the side of the house opened up all the way, and uh, what did what did we see? Yeah, and just just for reference, that ended up being a, about a 2.5 gallons per minute flow rate uh, with the spigot totally open. Uh, when we compared the two, it was it was really quite interesting. Um, not only were the slopes the exactly the same, um, the time to cool down to the time to get to 80 degrees was basically the exact same too. I mean, the the curves lay right over each other. Um, the, sl the initial slopes are the same. The only difference you see is, you know, like I was just mentioning, where you would stir it and the temperature at the probe would go up a little bit. Those aren't seen in the the one without stirring. But, I mean, the, the overall time and the even the cooling rate, you know, for the various temperature drops throughout the test were, was the same. Yeah, and maybe we can make a PDF of these graphs and right. post them out mm -hmm. there. Uh, so, yeah, you look at the <clears throat> you look at the data and the curves line up. 
Uh, and, and I guess we should say that uh, we, we were chilling five gallons of water, and I had my, I think my, my chiller is like a 40-foot a um, copper coil, but only about half of it was, was in the water. Uh, so, and it's, what, it was a quarter inch, is that inside or outside diameter? That'd be inside. Diameter. Inside diameter. Um, so, but, it, you know, we used the same equipment in, in each of these tests. So that was very surprising to me, and I think it's going to be very controversial. <laughs> and it may be something that we want to revisit at a later time. But was that surprising to you as well? Yes, it was. Because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, they say in, in every article that I've found, and I found a hand, handful, uh, in, in all the advice online, it says keep your chiller moving, you know, and it will cool your wort faster. So according to this this one set of data, it looks like that's not what's happening. Right. And, you know, this could be particular to, you know, your your standard method, which was, you know, in this case, we, we stirred every five minutes and you had a, a set number of yeah. rotations, right? What was that? It was five rotations. So it was enough to get the wort moving, you know, all the wort swirling in there. Uh, because this wasn't a, a constant stirring. You know, this was, you know, every five minutes over the course of about a... 19 minute experiments so we only had i think three three stirs throughout mm-hmm. that correct and the, and then uh so the common knowledge is that there that uh and again liquid uh, thermodynamics is not your <laughs> your forte but but you know the the kind of common wisdom is that there develops a kind of a coolness pocket around the uh, around the chiller, and unless there is some sort of motion to carry that efficiently through the rest of the wort, then uh, the wort doesn't chill as as efficient, efficiently or as quickly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, that's what it, I mean. That's what it says. But maybe it's maybe it's that. Uh, and again, this is just one you know one set of data. But um, maybe it's that the wort that is next to the next to the chiller gets ch- chilled more more quickly than the, than the rest and then when you swirl it around it evens it out right. but if you leave it alone maybe there's some convection uh you know uh, things that are happening in there that that even it out anyway right so i know that's controversial and we'll probably get email and we'll yeah. probably have to do another right, one, do another one. Right. <laughs> when the water's a little cooler um so uh, let's talk about about the data. Where, when we, you know, the spigot all the way open uh, was two and a half gallons per minute. Uh, so what was what was our total time? Uh, for the two and a half gallons per minute experiment, we ended up around eighteen minutes. Um, we can see that. Let me pick these out. But yeah, we dropped below it at just just over eighteen minutes. It's like eighteen point one. So eighteen minutes and six seconds, or something like that. And how much water did we use? In that one, we used 45 gallons of water. Woo! <laughs> right. <laughs> that seems like a lot. Right. Uh, so can you, in looking at the graph, maybe we won't, maybe, well, let's talk about the, the other data points uh, before we make any conclusions. And one thing that, that we also found out was it, it was very hard, at least with my type of spigot coming out of the side of the house, to regulate accurately the amount of water going through the the chiller because we did one round and i and i figured out that uh when the water first started going through the the spigot it was like what did i say six turns to go all the way open so so we figured you know i'll do four turns for the second test and it was basically the same flow rate right so <laughs> yeah, what's interesting, I mean, you see, if you see these graphs, we have, we ended up with fairly even numbers and it looks like, you know, those were our targets, 2.5, 1.5 and 0.5. But yeah, like you were saying, you know, we, we couldn't really get a, you know, a 2.0 or anything like that. It was, it seemed to be that, you know, with, with your ability to turn the spigot, we had, we basically had to go from 2.5 to 1.5. Yeah, and, and the way we measured that was that Keith was at the uh, the exit end of the of the hose coming out of the chiller, and with a five gallon bucket, and he timed how long it took to fill that five gallon bucket, and then you did you did the math, <laughs> right. and then we did check you know 
more than once throughout the experiment too so the flow rate was continuous you know I mean, it wasn't it wasn't changing during the experiment yeah nobody in the house was doing laundry right. or taking a shower or anything <laughs> so our second flow rate uh, wound up 1.5 gallons per minute just because it was we aborted that second uh, flow rate because it just wasn't different enough it was barely different so I only turned the the uh, the the crank the <laughs> the faucet a couple of times uh, after I heard the water start coming through and that wound up being 1.5 gallons per minute so what what uh, were the results there uh, as far as the time goes the time increased by about three minutes uh, three or four minutes we were up around 22 minutes total time on that um, but it, it knocked the water usage down almost by a third it was a little over 30 percent we were about 33 gallons of water usage on that one compared to the 45 from the two and a half gallons per minute so you had a basically a three or four minute time increase but you saved uh, 11 or 12 gallons wow that's a that's a big difference so the so again again i'm i'll i'll save the uh <laughs> save the conclusion making uh for last so the third time we did it uh or the third rate i barely turned on the faucet uh and it was just trickling through uh and it took forever to get those five gallons <laughs> and the outflow but that wound up to be half a gallon per minute correct yeah so yeah that was our third point was uh, 0.5 gallons per minute so where did we stand on the numbers there? Uh, the numbers there, the time was um, drastically different. It was it was double the rate. I mean, it was double the time needed for the one and a half gallons per minute even. It was over 40 minutes. It was closer to 42, 43 minutes. Um, again, though, even with that long amount of time, it was the most conservative as far as the, the water usage is concerned. Um, we were only about 21 gallons of water usage for that one. So... Again, that's another 11 or 12 gallons less than the previous experiment, but it came at the cost, the cost of basically doubling the amount of time necessary to cool it. So it, <clears throat> it's, it's more efficient to run this time-wise to run the spigot wide open, but at a certain point in the curve, it gets less efficient at taking out that heat versus the amount of water that you're spending right correct and you know one way to the way to look at that is you would take the the curves and you would you would look at the slopes of the curves and what that means is how steep the curve is at, at different points and so what we did at that point is we went every 20 degrees and looked at the slope for example you know 200 to 180 degrees and we looked at the slope of the curves and i i, I examined the 2.5 gallons per minute and the 1.5 gallons per minute and that so i've compared those slopes and then i did that every 20 degrees all the way down to the 80 degrees and and for example yeah what you're saying is the slopes are steeper for the highest flow rate at the beginning and it gradually comes more in line with the slopes of the 1.5 gallons per minute um basically there's so what you're looking at when you look at those slopes is you're looking at how many degrees you're pulling out of that water for every minute. And, you know, the, the 2.5 gallons per minute to get down to 180 was was very quick. It was taking out 44 degrees per minute. So mm. basically, yeah, I mean, it's less than half a minute and it's already down 20 degrees. Whereas the one and a half gallons per minute was taking out 31 degrees per minute. So, you know, it's closer to 45 seconds at that point. But then what you can do is you can see where do those slopes start to become the same? You know, where is there not a drastic difference between the two? And that seemed to occur around 120 degrees. Um, you see the, the two and a half gallons per minute from 120 to 100 degrees is taken out around six degrees per minute. And the one and a half gallon is taken out just over five degrees per minute. So there's mm -hmm. only a one degree for every minute difference between the two once they drop below 120 degrees. So in theory, uh, over 120 degrees, uh, the uh, the faster flow rate is smarter. Correct, um, but it's getting closer all the, all the time to the one and a half. You know, when we look at 140 to 120, there's about a three degree per minute temperature difference between the two, or cooling rate difference. So, if you're running the spigot flat out, or in this case, two and a half gallons per minute, you get your best bang for the buck the hotter the wort or the hotter the higher the temp the difference is between the temperature of the wort and the temperature of the cooling liquid that's correct 
So is there a is there a hybrid uh, flow rate that that would would be smart? It, it kind of depends on your priorities, you know. I mean, if you want the minimal amount of time, then uh, basically when we looked at the hybrid and we did the calculations based on, you know, if, let's say we were running two and a half gallons per minute until we hit 120 degrees and then we cranked it down to one and a half gallons per minute. Um, in that case, we ended up with about one or two minutes less time theoretically than the one and a half gallons per minute. So you're looking at about a 20, 20 minute total cooling um, and then you're using about one to two gallons more than the gallon and a half per minute mm. um, flow rate so you, you know you've you've saved yourself two minutes overall and you've <laughs> cost yourself two gallons basically so I mean it's you know is it that important to you to save two minutes to sit there and look <laughs> at your data and say oh now I'm at 120 I gotta go turn this pick it down to one and a half or you know is it more important to you to you know, save as much water as possible. So it's, so the, using that hybrid, you know, where you start off with a, a big flow rate and then turn it down, it doesn't seem to be paying off No, not for in me. either way. Right. Correct. So it seems like the, again, it, I guess it's, as you said, it's, it's up to your, your <laughs> criteria. If you're wanting to save time, crank it up and all the way. And if you want to save water, you know, use a, a low flow rate. Again, you know, the half a gallon per minute, you know, it's taken 43 minutes, something like that, to to chill. If you're, if you're happy with that, then you can save a lot of water. Um, you know, and I guess if you kept your, your, um, your kettle covered, you know, so that the, the bugs, you know, microscopic and otherwise don't fall into it, um, you know, I guess that that would, uh, that would be okay. Now if in the, now this is in the summertime or this is in warm temperatures and my, you know, this 75 degrees, I've tested the temperature of my tap water and it's been like 80 degrees, uh, before in the summer and then we, in the hot, you know, in the middle of the summertime. So in, in the wintertime, I take it, you know, when the tap water is, say 50 or I don't know what 55 or whatever uh, the temperature it is when it's really cool I'm I'm guessing that all of these numbers on the on the on this chart here would be lower right because you're right. you're it's having to shift, use but, yeah, that's, less that's time mm -hmm. but do you think that the relationship between each of the uh, times and temperatures would be relative in other words does this this scale uh, proportionally yes i think so i think you know with with the change in the flow rates you're going to see similar decreases as far as proportional decreases uh, you know um obviously it will be not these exact numbers and our slopes won't be those same you know 20 30 degrees per minute kind of thing um they'll actually probably get steeper at that point um because then again also if you're you know doing it outside like we were you'll have the ambient conditions mm -hmm. working for you as well but i think the relationship between the higher flow rate versus the lower flow rates as far as water usage and time would be, you know, similar. But again, it, it seems like to me that, uh, that the middle ground seems like the sweet spot, at least for me, um, you are saving, you are saving a bit of, uh, of water, uh, and, and the time is not that much, uh, not that much different. Right, yeah, that, you know, looking at this data before talking to you, that would have been my recommendation as well, as you know, set it down here at, you know, a gallon and a half for, for your setup and just, you know, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> and and we'll have to come back, maybe we'll have to do another set of experiments on the on the stirring. Right. Uh, because, you know, after looking at this, I'm not going to worry so much about, about stirring the wort, although it kind of makes me feel good to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm doing something. <laughs> Go get another beer. <laughs> what else? What else for the for the cause? Uh, you know, that's that's really it. You know, I do like the idea of looking more into this stirring, and you know, we can we can vary more things as far as you know a more constant stirring instead of the you know the every five minutes, which only gave us three stirs in this case. Um, you know, but I do think that's interesting as far as, you know, the common knowledge, as you say, is not being shown here. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thanks for your help, Alex. No problem. It's good to be here. Well, thanks again to Alex and to Keith. 
Uh, I will post a link to Alex's PDF with the graphs uh, in the description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. And if you have the Basic Brewing app, you can tap the little bonus button uh, to see them right there in your mobile device. If I remember to put them in there. (laughs) And if I forget, please email me. Let me know. And Alex says he's more than willing to do a follow-up experiment where we stir the water in the kettle uh, to see if our initial result on stirring versus not stirring is duplicated. So, in in the meantime, send us your questions on the processes uh, or your feedback on this whole thing. Uh, If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check all that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. You can get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo. You can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can find our logbooks where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all those out at basicbrewingshop.com. Also, take a look at our silicone pints while they're around. It's all until next time. Till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website's provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. <laughs> <laughs>